Year 10 and 11, welcome to your comparison of the poem's exposure and bayonet charge in preparation for your AQA English Literature Poetry Exam. As I do with all my comparative videos, here is a list of connectives that you are going to need if we're comparing. The connectives at the top in dark are for when the structure or the language devices are different. So you've got whereas on the other hand. However, in contrast, unlike and alternatively. And if devices are similar, we might use similarly, likewise, equally, as with and in the same way. Remember, this is a comparative exam. Some variation of the word of the word shows, so we don't say shows, 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 shows all the time. It's absolutely fine to use the word shows, but I wouldn't use it too many times. You can imagine what it would read like if you kept saying this device shows, this language device shows, this shows. So there's just some um, choices there. Suggests, implies, outlines, highlights, describes, communicates, connotes, emphasizes, reveals, displays, establishes. Portrays, represents, illustrates, informs, means, conveys and symbolises. So try, if you can, just to put, a, to put a bit of variation in there, I think. Dependent on the question and what your English teacher has taught you, this is just a suggested format for answering the question. We might start with the introduction, which should answer the question. Structure in exposure compare to structure in bayonet charge, language and exposure, compare that to language and bayonet charge, and then conclude. But again, that is just suggested. Please follow the advice of your English teacher and read the question carefully as well. If we look at the structure of the two poems, then exposure is down the left in red and bayonet charge is down the right. Exposure uses half rhyme and that adds a sombre tone under the surface of the poem and it adds a discord which challenges our expectations and remember in this poem our challenge our expectations are challenged because we don't expect the weather to be killing the men and it is and the men don't expect the weather to be killing them and it is underneath the poem this half rhyme like silent and salient adds this serious tone and we realised just how harrowing life was in the trenches. Regular stanzas are used throughout and that highlights the monotony of life in the trenches. And there's a subtle irony because we get the phrase, nothing happens, repeated over and over again. And the irony is that the men don't realise they're dying till later on in the poem. They haven't quite figured out that the wind and the snow and the rain is actually killing them. And they don't realise that until the rhetorical question, is it that we are dying? If you wanted a volta in this poem, a volta, remember, is when a poem changes tone. I think it is at the line, is it that we are dying? Because I think that is when they start to realise and accept that they will die and it won't necessarily be because of the enemy. As the poem progresses with ex what happens is the men's suffering worsens and by the final stanza they are on the verge of death and as I see your um, lines like is it that we are dying we turn back to our dying for the love of God seems dying show us this and shows us that first they acknowledge it then they turn to it and then they realize that religion their beliefs God can't help them And the poem shifts focus from the men to what they dream of, which in this instance is home, to what they believe in. And by the end of the poem, all three are broken, all three are gone. They don't believe that they're going to survive. They don't believe in their dreams anymore. And they realise that God is probably a figment of their imagination and actually can't help them. Okay, let's look at bayonet charge then. So bayonet charge begins with in media in media's rays, and that means in the middle of. So we are thrown into the action of bayonet charge, much like the the soldier was thrown into the action when he goes over the top without thought, and that's quite interesting because then we are almost placed in the situation of the soldier at first hand, thrown into something. 
Um, being at charge differs to exposure as well because where exposure uses regular stanzas, being at charge does the opposite and it uses irregular stanzas with the first and the third stanza being full of action and the second stanza is used to slow down the poem. And this second stanza slows down because he thinks about his actions and he actually realises what is happening and that is a daunting thought that he's gone running over the top and then realises and we get the word bewilderment in stanza two that he's confused about what he has to do as a soldier but also the whole process of war killing other people um, again there's a difference to exposure where exposure uses half rhyme being at charge uses a free verse um, and the free verse is the lack of order in the emotional charge of the soldier that his emotions change so as I say initially he's keen and he suddenly he awoke and was running and he lunges over the top and then he's confused and in bewilderment and then he's almost stuck um, and struggling later on in the poem and then we end with terror so we do have emotional uh, this emotional the emotional charge of the soldier and that he's got quite a few different emotions going on and that is your free verse and being at charge also uses enjambment and shazira please check your spelling of shazira it is a, a funny one to spell and what they do is they further emphasise the contrast between his movement and his figures. So Shazera, if we haven't done it before, it means a pause in the middle of a poetic line. So we get that in stanza three, we get it in stanza two, um, we get it in stanza one, only once, I think. Um, and it pauses the poem. But then we have instances of enjambment, especially in stanza two, where it's fast and furious. And those two linked together, so the run on lines linked to the pauses in the middle of individual lines, it creates it creates a sense of confusion and conflict because he's moving and he's running over the top, but his thoughts are staggering him in the sense that he's petrified. Uh, the Shazera also breaks up the flow and it's almost like the breathing of him. You can imagine he's... <gasps> and his breathing stopping because he's panicked. And as I said earlier, struggling because we get the word stumbling. The longer lines signify him rushing towards the enemy and our shorter lines obviously shows his hesitation. So that's quite an interesting structural device there. Okay, so make sure you note that one down. And then finally... The poem does not have a fluid rhythm. As I see, you've got your enjambment and your shazura and your longer lines and your shorter lines. And I suppose this is the internal conflict of the soldier, um, duty versus emotion, following military um, orders and being petrified at the fact that you're having to run towards death and, and the fact that you might be shot or killed. So make sure you pause the video here. There's quite a few things said there. More so on being at charge. So make sure you get down key things like uh, media rays and Shazira if you uh, hadn't already noted those things down. And now we will move on to language in both of the poems. So exposure again is on the left. Um, we can't, you can't really answer a question on exposure without personification and I've put a few examples there so personification iced east winds at Nivos mad gusts tugging on the wire flakes with lingering stealth come feeling for our faces his frost will fasten on this mud and us so the idea that the east winds knife them shows us and personifies the threat of the cold and the wind actually penetrates their skin and when it does it like cuts through their bodies and it hurts and as a reader we can feel it. We've all been out in the cold and then we get the mad gusts tugging on the wire and it's like it sounds like the wind is mad and tugging suggests it's incessant and it won't leave them alone and it's constantly attacking them and catching onto their clothing and onto them. 
and you mad gusts, it's out of control. Interestingly as well, if we're talking about the wind, it is described as nonchalant, which is again personification. And nonchalant means indifferent. So you've got the idea that the wind's attacking them and won't leave them alone and it's indifferent, therefore it doesn't care. In the face of all this suffering, the power of nature is unstoppable and it, it is, it's careless, it's carefree. It doesn't care that it is killing people and hurting people. If we go back up as well to the iced east winds, we've got a mixture of sibilants with the S sounds and hard, harsh consonant sounds of the D and the T. So listen, you get iced east winds that knife us and it creates a cutting bit of edge to the elements and we realise just how harsh the weather is and the fact that the men are sitting outside in this for hours on end. They've got no protection. And in this poem, we get a line about dawn. Now, usually dawn, which is obviously a new day, that usually is linked to hope and happiness and sunlight. But in this poem, dawn brings with her poignant misery. And it is personified as a weary female war commander massing her melancholy army. Now, the poignant misery of dawn shows us that, what I said earlier about the monotony of life in the trenches, that they're just waiting, they are waiting to die without realising that they are actually dying, which is the most terrifying thought about this poem. And then the personification of of the day and of the dawn as a, as a, as a female warrior, massing her army, massing makes it sound huge. Like, you know, like, they can't defend themselves, they will be slaughtered, they are vulnerable, and your alliteration in your massing her melancholy army again creates this sound of oppression. I've got more to say about exposure, which I'll put on the next slide, but because this is comparative, we'll just look to the right side for bayonet charge. So with bayonet charge, we get the pronoun he. Um, the soldier is anonymous um, in this poem, and therefore he becomes a more universal figure, as if it could be any soldier. So whilst the poem does focus on one individual, it actually represents all soldiers in World War I. And as the poem progresses, the soldiers' movements break down as he realises his actions, which I said earlier in the structure when we go from stanza one to two to three. And the verbs change. So throughout being at charge, Ted Hughes changes his verbs. Um, from something very simple, such as running, to lugged, to plunged, it, and we, we steadily see the loss of control and the panic of the soldier. Okay? And then we get the metaphor, his sweat heavy, stumbling across a field of clods towards a green hedge. Now, obviously, I mean, I think that's a straightforward metaphor, but if you've got your own interpretation, go for it. I think his sweat is heavy because war is a burden and it is a burden that he physically can't carry which leads to the stumbling. It's like a direct correlation there, isn't there? And stumbling suggests he is having trouble. He's having trouble running across the field and he perhaps falls. into obviously the simile the patriotic tear that had brimmed in his eye sweating like molten iron from the center of his chest in this simile we have the emotive language of periodic tear he's upset he has realized what he faces which is gunfire from the enemy the possibility of death um, the realisation that he probably isn't going to make it out alive and he becomes upset. And the tea is periodic, of, periodic obviously, because he's defending his country and, he, and he's doing something brave. In the simile, the tear becomes molten iron. And if molten iron was on your skin, it would burn you. And if it ended in the centre of, of your chest i.e. your heart, it would kill you. 
So the implication then is that this charge, this bayonet charge over the top, has killed the person that he originally was. And perhaps changed the person that he is. Uh, the personification of the bullet smacking the belly out the air is sound imagery. So when you go over the top, you can't see your enemy. You can hear them. And we know that because he says he's dazzled with rifle fire. You can't actually see his enemy, which makes it all the more petrifying that they are running blind into gunfire. So bullets smacking the belly out of the air. Listen to the alliteration and this plosive B sound there. And we hear what he would hear, the bullets, perhaps the cannons, explosions and it's petrifying because as I say they can't see and he already feels like he's carrying this burden like he's a changed person he starts to stumble and as a reader we realize that this is a terrifying situation and when we get into stanza two the key word in the opening line in bewilderment he almost stopped and bewilderment there is his confusion about his actions about the war. Why is he here? Why is he trying to kill other people? Why are other people who he doesn't know, strangers, trying to kill him? And it goes straight into a rhetorical question. In what cold clockwork of the stars and the nations was he the hand pointing that second? Huge rhetorical question because the stars and the nations are massive, um, impersonal, and it's as if the stars, this cosmic force, has decided his fate and they work in a detached manner. They are mechanical and technical and they don't show emotion. Cold clockwork. Look at that alliteration. The soldier doesn't feel that he's made a choice to participate in the war, which is why he's bewildered. He is merely the hand on a clock, a cog in a machine, performing this duty mechanically, um, and there's larger forces at play here that are determining his fate. And unfortunately, we, I think we realise that the chances are that his fate is death. If we go back to exposure, the clouds are presented as an army like German tanks, grey and stormy, and they line up in rank upon shivering rank, ready to attack. The repetition of rank there shows us that they, they're going to come again and again and again, and we are reminded there that actually the Germans aren't particularly the people to fear here, rather the enemy. The colour grey is, is very despondent and dull. And then, frighteningly, the snow appears to make conscious decisions about where it settles and where it attacks and how it attacks. We get flock, pause, renew, look at that triple that it, that it decides to stop and then it decides to start again. It decides to attack. Flock almost has an animalistic quality as well. And we know the flakes were personified earlier on with fingers that feel for the faces. The snow here is, is a deadly enemy. I've made another note of the sibilance with the hard consonants as well, just to show you the desolate atmosphere. Lasts, soaks, clouds, sag, stormy, massing, east, attacks, ranks, shivering and then a huge example is sudden successive flights of bullets streak the silence the sibilance in that line is powerful it's the incessant gunfire it is the in incessant attack of the wind of the rain of the snow these men are being battered they cannot escape death which is why they give into it and your sibilance is coupled with your assonance now the assonance is slightly different because the o's, the o sound, is used to emphasise the mood of the long, the long, drawn out, painful experience of the warfare. You've got o, grow, only, no, soak, slowly, ghost, home, and the the soldiers are struggling to comprehend the world outside of the war. And as I say, it's dragged on and it's painful. The title in Exposure is important as well because it has more than one meaning. They are exposed to weather. They are exposed to all the mental issues 
that the soldiers suffered during the war, post-traumatic stress disorder, because of what they experience or witness, and they are exposed to the, the enemy as well, who are trying to kill them. Easy metaphor, all their eyes are ice. They are ice in the sense that a lot of soldiers are lying dead in the cold weather, and also emotion, emotionally they're cold, they are detached, they are ruined. And that's a link to bayonet charge, because the soldier in bayonet charge, as I've just said, changes his persona changes he loses himself and also exposure as i said earlier uses the rhetorical question is it that we are dying and there's your volta there's the acknowledgement oh actually i'm sitting here and nothing's happening nothing's happening nothing's happening but am i dying and they are okay if we go back to being net charge we've got this uh, a simile um, he was running like a man who has jumped up in the dark and runs listening between his footfalls for the reason. So this is a massive image because it is a man running with no purpose. As we said earlier, he's confused about why he's there. What is he fighting for? And what a terrible thought that you are sacrificing your life and you don't know why. You are running around with a gun, you can't see your enemy, you can hear your gunfire, you're stumbling around and you've, you've got no purpose. That's a horrible, horrible image. And we get a Shazera as well after running. So we, we, we are forced as a reader to pause there and that's interesting. And then we're going to another simile, his foot hung like a statue sorry my my reading and pronunciation i'm sorry in mid stride and, and basically that's the comparison of a, st a statue so he's got this purposeless run and then he compares himself to a statue as if he's stopped still which links to the the top line in stanza two where he says i almost stopped perhaps he stopped still because he's petrified and because he's confused and because it's it's all too much when we're into stanza three, we have massive imagery in the hair and we, we are told through up a yellow hair that rolled like a flame and crawled in a threshing circle, its mouth wide open, silent, its eyes standing out. That image lasts three lines. We have Shazura after the word silent as well. And the scared hair parallels the soldiers. And that is the only other living thing mentioned in the poem. And the hair is terrified and defenceless, its mouth open, its eyes standing out. And we realise it's helpless when we get like a th in a threshing circle. And obviously, if the threshing circle and the threshing machine is coming for the hair, it's the idea that it's trapped and it's caught in a deadly situation, much like the soldier. Someone else's battle. If it's caught in the threshing circle, it's probably the farmer's battle. And the hair there, I suppose, is subject to it. The line to follow says he plunged past with his bayonet toward the green hedge. Plunged obviously sounds desperate, and I said our verbs change as the poem progresses. We get a motive language in king, honour, dignity, and there is a theme of bravery there. Um, through the word honour. But we are told that during these, this battle, these ideas and these luxuries and these royal connotations drop like luxuries. So for those directly involved in fighting, a belief in anything like a king or something uh, honourable or even God is meaningless and, and you abandon them in the fight for survival because of the brutality of war. And then the metaphor, his terror's touchy dynamite, is pretty much how the poem ends. And this is the dehumanisation of the soldiers, that they are weapons to be used rather than people. And that's a scary thought. It's also the idea that 
his terror will get him killed. He's so scared that, as we know, in the stands are above, he stops like a statue. And obviously, if someone's shooting at you and you stop running, you're an easier target. So his terror, the fact that he's petrified, might lead to his death. And in many respects, it is his terror and his fear that spurs him on to try to try and survive and kill the enemy. Okay, I hope this video was useful. It was a request. I have got two more slides. Or two, well, two more things to say, sorry, about being at charge. That, don't forget, we get images of nature, which is the hair. We've got the image of clockwork. The simile of the man running with no purpose. They are key. So don't forget to use those in your answer. As I say, I hope this has been useful in terms of comparing these two poems. Please check out my other videos. Just type Stacey Ray into YouTube. S-T-A-C-E-Y and Ray is R-E-A-Y. And good luck in your AQA English Literature Poetry exam.